Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Robert Doerr, president of the American Enterprise Institute, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's conversation with John Mackey. John is the co-founder and CEO of Whole Foods Market and the co-founder of the nonprofit Conscious Capitalism. And he's here today to talk about his new book, Conscious Leadership, Elevating Humanity Through Business. John, I can't think of a better guest to have on Thanksgiving week than you, and it's a pleasure to have you. Welcome to our discussion this, this afternoon. Thanks, Robert. Thanks for having me on the show. You know, as I read your book, and I loved your book, and I recommend the book because, um, you know, I'm now almost 18 months into my term as CEO of AEI, and while I've been a CEO in my previous uh, 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 businesses, uh, it's always good to be reminded of what makes uh, effective leadership work in any institution of any size. And you have a lot of great lessons about um, how to be a good leader. And one has to do with you know, having a purpose and one is having to do with lead with love and another has to do with innovation and integrity. But I wanted to ask you of all of these lessons that are all, all so important, which do you think is the most important? Which do you think you rely on as your go-to go to attribute that's made you so successful? Well, the first chapter in the book is called Put Purpose First. So I guess I better put it first. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, the purpose part is important because you, you, um, you seem to address, and I want you to address for our listeners, why you think it's true that even that, 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 that for-profit firms that are out to make money and develop a profit and, and, and pay shareholders, they are more success, most successful when they see a higher purpose. And give us a sense of that. Yeah, this is the single biggest misunderstanding about business and capitalism. I think there is. And until we get this corrected, capitalism is always going to be disdained uh, and criticized and attacked. It'll be attacked for its motivations because its motivations are seen as somehow they're impure. And yes, of course, business has to make money. Business doesn't make money, it'll fail. But that doesn't mean that's its purpose to make money. I mean, um, a metaphor, a good way to explain it is my body has to produce red blood cells. And if I stop producing red blood cells, I'm going to die. But just because I have to make red blood cells does not mean the purpose of my life is to produce red blood cells. It's a necessary condition, but it doesn't define who I am. Similarly, business has to make money or to fail. But business is really about creating value for other people. That's why it exists. That's why it exists, to create value for other people. And if it does a good job of creating good value and products and services that its customers want, then the business will flourish and it'll make money for its investors. But I think because business gets put in this narrow box that it's all about money. It's all about making money. I mean, that's that's so odd if you think about it, because if you ask what the purpose of a doctor is, doctors make a lot of money in our society, but I don't think they'd say, hey, I'm a doctor to make as much money as possible. Even if that's true, that's not the ethics that stand behind medicine. The ethics behind medicine are to heal people. Teachers educate. Architects design buildings. Engineers construct things. Every one of these professions refers back to some type of value creation that they're doing in the world to serve other people. And business is the greatest value creator in the world by far. And so we should be talking about it in terms of its value creation for its customers and all and the jobs it creates for its employees and the, the residual or tangential effects that happen when it tra trades with suppliers who also trade for voluntary reasons. They're benefiting and they're prospering as a result. And it creates value for investors in the larger communities. It creates value for all of these constituencies, all of these stakeholders. So we, we don't do ourselves a service by simply trying to explain business purpose as making as much money as possible. I think we lose the argument as soon as we say that for most people. And, and in your business, when you started Whole Foods Market, you, you had a very straightforward purpose, which was I think I understand it, to bring better quality, wholesome, natural foods to people so they could purchase them. I mean, that's a, a, a great purpose and, and you accomplish that. I mean, do you feel as if you've 
led to more people eating better, more healthy, more wholesome food? I mean, is, isn't that something that to be proud of that achievement? Absolutely. So our stated purpose today, so this, this is a good, let me explain a couple of things. Yeah. First of all, when I started the business with my girlfriend, I was 24 and she was 20. We were just a couple of kids really. And uh, yeah, we didn't have a stated higher purpose. We were just passionate about natural and organic foods and selling healthier food to people. And if you ask me what the higher purpose of Whole Foods was back in 1978 or when Safer Way got going, I just said higher purpose. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we just want to sell healthy food to people and earn a living and have some fun doing it. <laughs> Guess what? Those things all still exist at Whole Foods. They're all well. The fun part is had a tough go in 2020 with COVID, but in general, that's still part of who we are. But you know, our purpose has deepened in the last 42 years. So our stated, our official stated purpose now is to nourish people in the planet. And that has a lot of different depth, a lot of depth, depth to that by how you define nourish and how you define people and how you define planet. They all have different layers to them. So I do think every, every business that you really admire the most has a higher purpose. And I've known hundreds of entrepreneurs in my lifetime, hundreds, very, very few of them start their business just to get rich. Sure, they want to make money. They'd like to get rich. And mostly they're passionate about something. If you read the biographies of people like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, um, Jeff Bezos, these guys were, you know, they were passionate about something, something they wanted to create. So excited, in fact, they just had to get going on it. And, uh, yeah, they made a lot of money because they created a lot of value for other people. Now, when, you, when you're telling the story of purpose and, and getting the message of the purpose of a company or an institution or organization down throughout to every member of it. You tell a story I actually had not never heard, and I think of myself as a little bit of a, a his, his story buff, especially about the Kennedy administration. And when President Kennedy was touring the Space Center, he ran into a, a custodian, someone who was you know, mopping the floor and cleaning up the place. And he said, what are you doing? And he said, the custodian said, I'm helping to get a man on the moon. And I wanted to ask you how, I've struggled with this at AEI, how do you, get everyone in the building to be united behind one purpose? How do you get that message out? How do you make that? You, you refer to your uh, people who work at Whole Foods as team members. How do you do that? Well, that's a good question, Robert. And, it, you know, it's not easy. Um, I think the first thing is the leadership has to embody the purpose themselves. If you're not living the purpose, people pay so much more attention to, to what you do and how you show up in the world and what you say. In fact, People are, you know, we have a very well attuned antennas for hypocrisy. Witness the governor's faux pas in California or Nancy Pelosi's faux pas with the spa. So when we see hypocrisy, we are really, really on for it. And people are always looking to call me a hypocrite. So they're always looking to see how I make. So it's very important that I personally and other leaders embody the higher purpose of Whole Foods. You have to walk the talk or it's just talk. That being said, um, in a company like Whole Foods, we have, a, we have about 100,000 people now that work for the company. And so we're getting, with turnover and continued growth, we're getting adding on 10 to 20,000 new team members every year. And so how do you keep the purpose? Um, how do you institutionalize it? And the only way you can do it is you, you have to talk about, it has to be part of the orientation. It has to be something that you talk about all the time. It's important that the leaders reference what they're doing back to what the higher purpose of the organization is. You, you show it all the time. You talk about it all the time. And because you have new people coming in all the time, you can never take it for granted. Now, when you have a very resilient, powerful culture, the culture does a lot of the work for you because other people that are there that have already internalized the values and purpose of the organization, they will spread it. They act like an immune system for an organization particularly an organization that's been around for a long time, they have a culture based on their values and their purpose. And if it's a good, strong culture, then you can expect the organization to do its work in getting people converted over. If you don't have a good culture or one that's, that's there's a lot of hypocrisy and people don't think you're living up to it, um, then it won't be very effective. So, but purpose is something that you, you, you can never, hey, I'll give you an analogy right now. 
I have no doubt in my mind that the United States has a higher purpose. It has been. It's it's there in the Declaration of Independence. It's there in our Bill of Rights. And yet, you know, it's not being taught. It's being forgotten. Right. A lot of the country no longer resonates with what the founding purpose of America is. And uh, so we've done a very poor job of continuing to communicate the higher purpose of the United States. I and completely agree with that. And we at AI completely agree with that. We cannot, we had a great scholar who wrote a book called Learning Patriotism. You have to teach those values and you have to talk about them all the time. So people recognize what is the source of our success as a country. And it is in our founding documents. And we have a whole unit at AI that's focused on that. And we wanna do more of that on college campuses and even with younger students. So communicate, communicate, communicate is, is exactly right from my perspective. It's worked for me as yeah. well, but it is a problem as a country. So, Robert, yeah. the reason I love AEI and one reason I contribute to AEI is because of that very thing. Now, I wanted to ask you about leading with love because I, I, I love that, too, about your book. And, and you, you have a, 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 um, a way in which you encourage a positive collaboration and positive feedback from one worker to another. Can you just tell a little bit about that? I think you have a practice in meetings where you conclude by saying, tell us about that. Sure. Well, first I'll say that um, love is oftentimes not associated with corporations, which in fact are generally seen as sort of heartless money grubbers. Oh, yeah. It's part of their image problem they have in the world. And it's, it's due to the metaphors that we have about business as being hyper-competitive. We use war metaphors to explain business. We use Darwinian metaphors to explain business. We use lots of hyper-competitive sports metaphors to explain business. And um, when you're at war, there's really not much place for love. So check that at the door, do that with your family. Hey, we have a Thanksgiving, you can express some love there, maybe around Christmas time. But uh, check it at the door when you come to work here, because we're at war, we're, we've, we've got to we gotta, we gotta win. And that's very unfortunate because love is a very, very, it's not weak, which is what many people associate it with. It's not, it's not just a feminine virtue. It's also a masculine virtue. And love is the glue that holds an organization together. It's, it's, I say, if you give two things to people, then they'll love your organization and they'll stay with it decade after decade after decade. Whole Foods has very low turnover. It's one of the first things Amazon noticed. God, you got a lot of people that have worked here more than 20 years and Amazon has. And the, the reason why is if you give people purpose and you give people a sense that they're cared about, that they're loved, then that's what people want. They want purpose and they want love. If you can meet both of those desires and needs, then you're going to have a great organization. So appreciation is one way you can release love in an organization. And so this is something Whole Foods does. That and it's the simple. If you got nothing else out of my talk today, but remember this one thing. I agree. If you just end your meetings with appreciations, you will release love in the organization. So what Whole Foods does is every time we have a meeting, we wrap it up by doing voluntary appreciations. They're not mandatory. Nobody has to do it. Um, but what happens is, it's if you do an authentic appreciation of someone else, you can't do an authentic appreciation without opening your heart. You can, mouth, you can, and people know the difference when somebody's just saying something and when they're actually feeling that and expressing it from their heart. So when you, when you do an, an authentic appreciation, you will open your heart and love will flow from you and others will pick up on it. In addition, it's very hard to stay in judgment of someone who's just given an authentic appreciation to you. If, if Tom, if I might've thought Tom was sort of a, you know, kind of a jerk and Tom is there saying how much he, he appreciates the things I do um, uh, and he's doing it in an authentic way, not just sort of sucking up to me, then I'm going to probably rethink who Tom is. I'm going to look at him with fresh eyes. So I'll tell you some stories at Whole Foods. So appreciations have become such a big deal at Whole Foods that uh, with, with my leadership group, with our senior leadership group, that a couple of years ago, we were spending so much time doing appreciations at the end of meetings that we had to rules. We had to limit the number of appreciations. And first we went, look, you can't appreciate everybody on the team here. You just do it on your own. We're going to limit you to three appreciations. And then that still took too long. So then we said, you know what? You've got one appreciation. Make it count. If you have other appreciations, good. 
but do them outside of this meeting. And so we could get our appreciations with one down to about 30 minutes, which is probably a reasonable amount of time. Um, but try it. It's very powerful. And I've had other people, other organizations, other entrepreneurs and CEOs tell me we started doing appreciations. Everything changed after that. So you've mentioned a couple of times in our conversation already, the, the fact that, that you guys have, have, have merged with Amazon and there's been this, you know, quite remarkable coming together of two iconic American companies. And I wanted you to tell us a little bit about that and how that's going and whether there have been tensions. And then I also, but I also wanted to point out that you have another story in the book about how Jeff Bezos had apparently had, and I didn't know this either, where he, when he had meetings, he always has an empty chair for the customer. So the customer is always represented. Do I have that right? Or, and tell us a little bit about the Amazon Whole Foods Market, Whole Food Markets merger. Well, the empty chair is, um, uh, it's part of the Amazon story. Uh, whether they still actively do that or not, I'm not sure, but it's part of the, it's part of the Amazon mythology. Okay. Uh, it's probably based on real, real time stuff that happened. Yeah. Uh, so one way to think about a, a big a merger between two large companies and Whole Foods was a fortune 200 company when Amazon bought us. Um, uh, it's a little bit like a marriage. And, uh, uh, and I say that because, um, you're coming together voluntarily for mutual gain and benefits, and hopefully because you really admire the other the other person. You might, you know, I use the metaphor of like a whirlwind romance and fall, love at first sight. And I, if I told that story, you'd see it. But to save time, I won't retell that story. But um, when you get married, and most of the people will know what I'm talking about. If you if you're going to get married, you're going to change. That's just that's inevitable because the other person is going to influence you and you will, you will gradually become a, um, I'm going to move over to get the sun off my face. There we go. That's better. Uh, you will gradually change. And um, Amazon's had a big impact on Whole Foods. We've gradually changed. But on the other hand, we have a very, very resilient culture. I always say in a healthy marriage, there's a me, there's a you, and there's an us. And so they all three have to be healthy. So Whole Foods has to, we have to stay Whole Foods. We have to, we have to follow our higher purpose. We have to fulfill our core values. We have to be Whole Foods. We have a unique special culture. And Amazon has largely respected that. Now our culture is evolving, but not because Amazon's cramming a bunch of things down our throat, but just because we're adopting certain Amazonian processes that are influencing us. I'll give you one example. Whole Foods tends to make a lot, previously the merger, we would be, I would say we were more intuitive in our decision-making and Amazon is very, very data driven in their decision-making process. So a lot of times we'd be talking to Amazon and we'd be giving our opinions, our theories, and they'd say, show us the data. And, you know, we, you know, we're not going to make this decision unless you show the data. And they, and they have a practice there where you're going to write up what's called a six pager, submit your arguments with data supporting it. If you do a good job of that, then you're going to get the decision that you want. And if you don't do a good job, you're going to get, you're going to be sent back to the drawing board or just told no. So Whole Foods has begun to think more that way, more data driven in our decision making. And that's being a positive thing for us still have our intuition and our, and our sort of entrepreneurial take on things, but we're more data driven. So how's the merger going? And I'm going to pivot back to that. It's going pretty well because, um, Whole Foods is evolving. Amazon thinks long term. We're able. We're able. We've been able to make three, and now we're working on our fourth price reduction. Something that our company badly needed to do pre-merger. Um, Amazon's added a lot of cool technology, and uh, new, and I, I go through in the book. I talk about how it's been a win for every one of our stakeholders. It's been a win for our customers through lower prices. Win for our team members. Amazon pretty soon after the merger increased the starting pay to fifteen dollars an hour, which basically result because you got to increase everybody else's pay because you, you got to level everybody up. Um, that was very expensive. We, we, we counted the cost to Amazon said, this is first year is going to cost $250 million. You sure you want to do that? And they did. And of course that was great for morale. Team members loved it. 85 at that time we had about 90,000 people, 85,000 of them got a raise in pay. And then they were pretty excited about that. So win for our team members, win for our suppliers. A lot of our suppliers started selling to Amazon. They weren't selling to Amazon before. 
So that's been a good thing for them. Greater distribution. Win for our investors. Our, our, from the time we began uh, talking to Amazon to when the deal closed, they got a $4 billion increase in, in valuation. So that was a win for them. And I think a win for all the community aspects of it as well. Whole Foods is philanthropy and the things we're doing in our communities. Amazon has supported that, has not tried to cramp that at all, and has added additional donations in some cases. So win, 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 win. Very, very good. Do you worry just generally not only about your situation, but just generally about the, uh, the, negative, the potential negative impact of size, Yeah. large size? Does it make it harder to lead the way you want to lead? I'd say the biggest challenge, I mean, uh, as a result of this merger has been Amazon is probably one or two and or three, one of the top three for sure of companies in the world that gets scrutinized. Everything they do is under a microscope. So Whole Foods, we were, you know, we were big, but now we're, everything we do is under the microscope. And that's pretty bizarre. And we've also got to think about Anything we say or do, we don't want that to negatively impact Amazon. And of course, Amazon doesn't want. But what's interesting is that I think I was talking to um, the guy I report to at Amazon one time. And he says, well, you got to remember, he, he's using my metaphor of marriage. He says, yeah, when you married into this family, you, you, you know, you got a bunch of in-laws now. And uh, yeah, some of them are, you know, some people don't like the in-laws too much. And you're going to have to live with that because you're part of the family now. And I thought that was a very clever way of putting it, that um, when people are mad at Amazon, they're mad at Whole Foods and vice versa. So that, that's different, being under the microscope so, so closely all the time. I have to be guarded to a little bit about what I say in an interview like this, because uh, uh, somebody will hear it somewhere and the media could do a headline out of it. So I got to be careful. I don't want any headlines showing up here. Well, we, we, you speak freely with us. We're, we're, we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yes, I understand. Now, listen, at the in, 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 in the end of the book, you have an appendix about something you call cultural intelligence. Yeah. And you it, this now we're going to shift a little bit from your company and we're going to come back to your company and leadership of companies in a minute. But I did want to ask about this in, in an effort to sort of get to sort of what's your view of where we are as a country. So, um, and you talk about sort of three kinds of cultural intelligence, the traditional, the 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 modern and then the progressive, right. and, and, it, and traditional is kind of the old sort of rules-based, very focused on faith and church. Modern is the liberal, sort of liberal America, the open uh, society, uh, believes in, in you know, science and change. And then progressive has a kind of, it's a little step further, but it also has a mild authoritarian bent. And then you talk about something post-progressive culture. Could you just tell us a little bit about what that is? And, and because it looked to me a little bit like the divided, something that gets us past the divisions that are plaguing America, yeah. or maybe I'm wrong. No, you're right. This is a good framework. And those of you that are interested in following up, can if you, we have an appendix at the very end of the book that goes into some detail about this. And uh, chances are the authors might write a further book about this. Because it looks like you were laying the seed for something bigger later. Yeah, we've... We've got a book that we're talking about called Conscious America, and that yeah. and we'll dive into this deeper. Uh, but uh, if, to understand the United States, if you think about it in terms of worldviews, and there are th three dominant worldviews in America. The first one is a more traditional worldview, which is based on faith, family, and the country. And it, it's got uh, traditional values about, um, about religion, about family, about, um, uh, it harkens back to the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. It's very AI, very yeah. AI. We're comfortable in that world. And um, the kind of heroes you might get in traditionalist world would be like Ronald Reagan and, and uh, Winston Churchill and William Buckley, Phyllis Schlafly, and people like that. And so the modernist worldview is, is and, and, and so uh, a traditional worldview would, would have a lot more uh, belief in sort of truth being revealed through uh, revelation, through faith. Whereas the modernist is much more scientific. It's more the enlightenment of, uh, of progress through science, through reason, through capitalism, 
and uh, uh, it's if you think about we 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 estimate that about thirty percent of the population in the United States is traditional in their in that that's where they're anchored, and about fifty percent is anchored in modernism. So some of the examples of modernists would be Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, uh, Madison, John F. Kennedy, Einstein, Edison, Milton Friedman, in some ways, is archetypal modernist. Um, and uh, guys like Bill Gates is another strong, strong modernist. Now, the progressives, which make up about 20% of the population right now, we estimate, that is... So each of these comes out and they, as the worldview evolves, they, they partly reject the worldview that, they, that tr became before them. So modernism rejected faith. It rejected religion largely. To, so many modernists or atheists, they believe in reason. They believe in science. They don't believe in scripture or reveal revelation, things like that. And so part of them, they, there's, there's a rejection of what comes before. Um, but, but until progressivism arose, you had this, you had this alignment between traditionalist ethics and modernist science that sort of drove America for many, many, many decades until uh, progressivism came along. And then the new worldview comes about because their flaws or failures in the previous worldviews. So modernism did not completely realize so some of the things that progressivism has come about is realizing the limitations of modernity. And so the environmental movement has come out of that because modernism does with producing economic progress. There are externalities that come out, uh, out of that that uh, can negatively infect the environment. And so people that are progressive tend to have very strong environmental views. Um, we know we have, particularly this year, we but in the last few years, we've had the anti-racism movement, right. which is very progressive, very, you know, the whole woke uh, ideology is a, is a progressive mindset. And basically um, arguing that America is inconsistent with its founding values of equality of all and that the uh, um, that we have not done enough job, a good enough job in overcoming racism, having inclusivity and diversity. So that's been in obviously in the media a lot. Uh, of course, you know, I see that we've made a lot of progress in America, but we still have some problems, right? So um, that that helps motivate it. I'd say the progressive view is also pretty globalist in the sense that it's it's very concerned about inequality suffering by any any place in the world really and so there's a strong anti-modernist streak to progressivism as well a distrust of science except when it serves their ideology a mistrust of um uh progress because yeah. they they and they don't like capitalism much they don't like capitalism that's right it's there's a rejection of capitalism and so there's a there's an element of socialism frequent and an anti-modernist streak to it so here's here's that's those are the three we got 30 percent traditionalist 50% modernist and about 20% progressives progressives because they they dominate academia Hollywood um, and the media punch way above their weight class in terms of their actual numbers um, but that's the cultural war. We got these three worldviews that are struggling with each other. So how are we going to move past it? And the authors argue that there, we have to go post-progressive. And the essence of post-progressivism is to recognize that all three of these worldviews have, have dignities and disasters. There are good things about them and there are bad things about it. And what we have to do is honor the good things in each of these worldviews. So, for example... We have to recognize that a lot of some of the progressive insights are important and they need they shouldn't go away, but we can't throw out capitalism and replace it with socialism. That'll be a disaster. Socialism has been tried 42 times in the last 100 years and 42 failures. It doesn't work. It's the wrong way. We have to keep capitalism. I would argue we need conscious capitalism. I wrote a book on it. We need conscious leadership, which is capitalism but done in a much more conscious way taking into a, in, to in, take into account higher purpose 
stakeholders, human flourishing, and done in a very conscious way. So we, we need to take the best of all of these worldviews and make sure the very bad things that we can recognize bad things. So bad things that might be the disasters that might be in a traditional worldview are racism, bigotry, sexism, homophobia. That could be uh, an accurate accusation sometimes of traditional values. Modernists, we can recognize that sometimes it uh, can be captured by special interest, um, that it can be indifferent, it can be elitist, it can be um, uh, uh, uncaring, so to speak, about... Materialistic, it can be a little overly materialistic. Right. Be overly materialistic. And then we look at some of the disasters in, in progressivism, anti-modernism, reverse patriotism, so we're, we're no longer patriotic about America, it's the worst country that's ever existed. Um, it very can be statist, very authoritarian. Yes, it can be self-righteous and scolding, yes. telling yes. everybody that criticizing them, canceling people out that have different views. We see, we clearly see a lot of the disasters for progressivism right now because uh, they're on they're on display. Right. But they're also the beauties of progressivism that we need to integrate to go forward in a healthy way. So if America is going to get to the next place, we need to integrate the best of each of these three worldviews and minimize the worst of each of these worldviews. And we would call that post-progressivism or what we call in the book, we call it the in integral worldview. Well, and I think it's fascinating and I'm really encourage you to keep that work going because we see that divide all the time. And, and I wanted to ask you about where you see it in your stores. Um, you know, if you look at the map of America with regard to this last election, you know, this red blue thing, rural urban divide, and also the elites versus the non elites. And, you know, you have in, you have stores in both kinds of America and you have workers and customers in both kinds of America. And I just wondered from your perspective, after all these years of being right in the middle of that, is that divide as pronounced and difficult and painful as it looks? Or do we exaggerate it because of the media attention it gets? No, I think there's a pretty big divide. Uh, the, 2020 has been a tor terrible year because of COVID and everybody being locked up and people getting lonely and getting angry and getting frustrated, people losing their jobs, people, their businesses failing. It's people on edge. We saw the riots that happened this summer. I mean, Whole Foods had a number of stores that have been damaged. We were damaged just a couple nights ago in Portland. A couple of our stores were damaged and that's happened. Uh, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 of our stores have suffered damage during the peaceful, peaceful protests. Um, and so we have our team members, uh, you know, we had a big controversial um, controversy this summer about dress code. We, I mean, uh, cause Whole Foods has always had sort of like, we don't want you to work. We want you to wear, we, we don't want you to promote whatever your political causes are, whether it be Black Lives Matter or Make America Great Again or whatever it is, check it at the door. We want you to be serving our customers and not bringing politics into the stores. And, and that's been controversial. We just, just had a big blow up just last week because we didn't want our Canadian team members to be wearing poppies. And we actually had the, the, the Congress or the legislature of um, uh, Canada condemn Whole Foods Market for uh, telling people they want, just wanted them to wear official company dress. Uh, and, uh, you know, Whole Foods, when you get the government threatening to shut you down, you will, you will change your dress code. And we did for Canada. And so it's, and I, I would even wonder if that would have happened if, Whole, if Amazon wasn't uh, the owner of Whole Foods. I'm not sure it would have. Everything yeah. magnified because of the Amazon connection. That's so unfortunate. I, that's really troubling. And the d news about disturbances at your stores. I mean, you know what that it seems to me that like, are you are you e eager to, to be more active in Portland and get Portland's I mean, I'm from New York and, you know, we know protests and disturbances, but, but you know, we don't under the period of time that I worked there, we did believe in a certain kind of order and respect for property. Is that lost in those being, in that community? It's being lost. I don't know. It's being challenged to put it that way. Here's the thing. We're grocers. Okay. We just want to sell food yeah. to people. 
we, we have to do that. We have our our team members have to be safe. We've had stores broken into, our, and we 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 give quick instructions. You know, we have in Chicago, in New York, in Seattle, in Portland, in Oakland, uh, in, in in several other cities as well. We've had disturbances, and you know, we have protocols in place protect our team members. Uh, they're far more important than property. So we've had team members run out the back door. People, some of these people actually break into the stores. They come in with baseball bats and they just start banging our cash registers and just going into the wine department, slaughtering, you know, hitting the wine bottles and just being destructive. So business has to be, you know, we need peace. We need yes. peace. peace. Commerce is based on, um, uh, on peace and uh, people. Law. Rule, rule of law. We need the rule of law. And uh, I think that rule of law has been challenged a little bit and is being challenged. So we're kind of in a rocky place in America right now. And uh, we're, you know, defunding the police in a lot of communities. And, and uh, uh, so it's harder to do business. We have to hire a lot more security guards now. <laughs> Speaking of harder to do business, I did want to ask you about the innovation and startup culture in America. And this is a question we're getting from our audience. Um, do you think that you could do what you did all those years ago as easily, or is the restrictions on our ability to um, start a business, grow a business, be free to establish a, a really successful uh, enterprise? Is that is do you feel that's lost? It's a good question, Robert. I don't really know because you know I've been doing this for forty two years. Yeah. Uh, pretty easy to start a business back in 1978. Uh, I just opened the door for business one day. <laughs> and guess what? The, the government bureaucrats came around and said, well, what was your health department certificate? I said, do we need one of those? So then where's your, where's your building permit? And they came around, but they didn't shut us down. We just, they just said, you got to get that. We got to pay, we had to pay a fee and uh, get And you always focused on your purpose. You said, I know what I want to do. And you tell a lot of stories about business people who just kept focusing on what they wanted to achieve. And when they ran into roadblocks, if they kept their eye on that bigger goal, they business, ultimately got through them. Business people have to constantly innovate around uh, bureaucracy and stupid rules and figure out ways so they can stay in business. I mean, that's reality. Business has always had, from the whole history of business, and one way is dealing with, you know, you need rules, you need regulations, you need law so that our stores are not broken into and looted all the time. You need police. Um, on the other hand, uh, you can overly regulate business, so it's hard to do business. And then the whole society becomes less wealthy and less prosperous. Um, I want to come back to the book again, because I just, I do really like the book. It's great lessons for leaders. And, uh, but one of the things that I love about it is that you don't only tell it through your story, you tell it through the story of, you know, a hundred other business people who've started businesses and led with these values. And I guess I wanted to ask, what's your sense? Isn't, isn't your, your sense that, that these kinds of leadership values are on the rise or, they're, they're more prevalent than you realized, or, or do you think you're, you're fighting uphill against a, a culture that really needs to be changed dramatically in the business world? It's evolving. It needs to evolve. Otherwise, the socialists are going to take over. That's how I see it. And, uh, um, and that's, 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 uh, that's the path of poverty. But they talk about trickle-down um, wealth, but... Socialism is trickle up poverty. It just impoverishes everything. And uh, that's my fear. I mean, that's my fear that, uh, that the Marxists and socialists, academic, the academic community is generally hostile to business. It always has been. This is not new. If you read Deidre McCloskey's work, you will see that um, the, all the minority groups that are business people have always been persecuted. The Jews in the West and the Chinese in the East are the two best examples. Um, the aristocrats for the clerisy, the intellectuals, the the clergy, they they've always despised business as sort of, you know, it's what tradesmen do. They're 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 trading. They tr they're making a profit. They're terrible people. They have the wrong motivations. They're not gentlemen. They're not uh, you know. I mean, if you if you study European history, that if you were a, 
good business person, you'd be called a Jew, even if you weren't Jewish. That was that was that was a, a, a an attack on uh, um, on business culture in a way. So now uh, the universities are. I mean, you go through there and. They're so progressive and they're so anti-capitalist. I mean, when I go speak at universities, for example, sometimes I get hecklers and uh, sometimes they, they disinvite me. But more often, um, I watch the students, particularly if I'm speaking at a business school, they love the message. You can do well and you can, you can, you can be prosperous and you can, you can fulfill a higher purpose. That is music to their ears. But the professors are very skeptical. Their arms are crossed. And, and they want to argue with me about it. They're, they're, one of the interesting things to me about business schools, if you think about it, Robert, who teaches in medical schools? Who are the teachers? Doctors. Who teaches in law schools? Lawyers, former lawyers. Who yeah. teaches in business schools? Well, not as many businessmen. Yeah. Yeah, not, not business people, intellectuals teach. Yeah. Most of the intellectuals who, who've never actually been in business at all. Right. It's very interesting. And uh, who don't actually understand business, don't particularly don't understand entrepreneurship, and uh, actually can oftentimes be hostile towards what they're very, very thing they're teaching. So um, that's a particular challenge. Um, and yet you, how many people do you employ? Uh, about 100,000 now. 100,000 people with jobs. I mean, that's valuable. That Those are livelihoods. Those are what those are the well-being. Those are pathways up, and that—that's a greater contribution to human flourishing than universities. I mean, in some ways, I mean, it's just tremendous. I mean, I—I'm a former welfare administrator, as, as I mentioned earlier, and so I've—I've I've lived off people providing jobs. That's what I counted on when the economy was strong and retail and grocers and people in all kinds of industries that hired low-skilled workers were hiring. That was just—that's—that's that's the best thing we could have. So let me be clear about it. Capitalism, or actually I prefer Deidre McCloskey's word for innovationism. Innovationism is the greatest thing that humanity's ever created. I mean, if you go back 200 years ago when, when, when innovationism was really beginning to pick up steam, 94% of everybody alive on the planet Earth lived on less than $2 a day. 94%, only 6% made more than $2 a day. And that's in today's dollars. Today, that's under 10%. The average lifespan 200 years ago was 30. Now it's 72.6. In advanced countries, developed countries, it's closer to 80. Um, illiteracy rates 200 years ago across the planet were 88%. Now they're 12%. I mean, if you read Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, you will just see documentation after documentation after documentation about how much the world has progressed. It has been science and technology combined with innovationism as the entrepreneurs took the scientific discoveries and operationalized them to make our lives better. It is the greatest thing that humanity has ever done. Business people are not the villains of the story. They're the heroes of the story. The entrepreneurs are the ones that, that, that create great progress. And um, yeah, they're universally vilified for the most part. If you look at the studies and the, if you look at the polls, people don't trust business. They think business is because their motivations are wrong. Business is greedy and selfish and exploitative. All it cares about is making money. And so it can't be trusted. It corrupts the political culture. It's fundamentally a bad thing. And that's why we're seeing this move towards socialism, because capitalism, they see, is inherently corrupt. That is wrong. Capitalism is the greatest thing humanity's ever done. We've told a bad narrative, and we've let the enemies of business and the enemies of capitalism put out a, a narrative about us that's wrong, it's inaccurate, and it's uh, doing tremendous damage to the minds of young people. We have to counter that. And so yep. the reason I wrote Conscious Capitalism and Conscious Leadership is to counter it. Yeah. Yep. And you and that I completely I think you're right. And, and I think we have to counter. I also think we're the, the victim of our success. I mean, when, when things go bad, if socialist policies take over and the market, not the market, but unemployment goes down to, you know, where it's been in the past or people are long term unemployed, all of a sudden people are going to realize the benefits of a growing and prosperous economy, I think. They may not realize it, Robert. I mean, the reality is what we've done in the last 200 years has never happened before. Okay, humanity for the most part 
had very slow progress. And that's because business people were basically so regulated, the genie never got out of the bottle until, until the Enlightenment, until, until for a brief period of time, the intellectuals at least went neutral on business and saw maybe there's some good in this. And then we exploded and, and now they're trying to stuff the genie back in the bottle. And if they stuff it back in the bottle, we will stagnate, we'll begin to regress. And uh, um, I'm not saying the whole technological civilization will collapse, but it, it will not progress it will be, and it will begin to stagnate and it will start to decline gradually. If, I mean, if we put in some of these uh, Green, New Neal, Green New Deal policy, right. then we're going to start to see uh, us go backwards. So that's... They're, so you're really looking at the, the longer term trend. You're not caught up in you know, this election or this crisis, but you have mentioned COVID a couple of times. And I just wanted to get your sense of of where we are in, in, in the communities that your stores serve and, and your sense as a large employer and a business person in America, are we, are we um, and, and your, your observation of the pharmaceutical industry and, and others that have moved so quickly to develop a vaccine, are you, are you feeling we're getting, we see the light at the end of the tunnel here and, and are things gonna get better? And the other thing is just, I hate to ask you a, a sort of mundane business question, but, but I, I, was, I thought that some people in the grocery business, there were, there were some upticks during COVID because people were eating at home more. But did that not happen in your business? No, our sales are way up. Way up. Way up. Don't, um, the media reports things wrong for two reasons about Whole Foods. The first one is, is that our transaction count in the stores is down. The traffic counts are down but they're down for two reasons. The first one is Whole Foods does a lot of business in prepared foods, office workers coming in for lunch. And with offices closed down during COVID, we didn't get that traffic in. So the average traffic counts went down then. Secondly, our online business has tripled since COVID. They've gone up 300%. So actual sales are up. I'm not gonna tell you how much they're up, they're way up, uh, and uh, but just inaccurately reported. So Whole Foods has done well during COVID. And I think all supermarket chains have done well because restaurants that, you know, people have, they've made a transition temporarily, I believe, to not eating out as much and eating a lot more at home. And that's been good for supermarkets, all of them, Whole Foods, Walmart, Kroger, Publix, all of them. And you've, as a, you've been able to adjust to whatever uh, COVID restrictions that have been in place and government interventions, you're, you're, you're not, you're, what's your view on that? Well, I mean, um, first of all, Whole Foods has a, a duty and responsibility to keep our customers and team members safe. So I'm actually very proud of the fact that our, co our company kind of was out in front of a lot of this. And I'll say partly because Amazon pushed us real hard to be out in front on it. And uh, we ended up, uh, you know, we've been recognized in a couple of different publications as the safest supermarkets in America during COVID. So most people have copied a lot of what Whole Foods went out first doing from mask to disinfecting to cleaning uh to te temperature testing things like that so um i mean and i think we've been very successful in terms of, okay. of infections the number of people that have died they're they're relatively small at whole foods obviously if i told you how much it'd be a headline so i'm not going to tell you how much but pretty low pretty low and um but, you know, let's make no mistake about it it's been a very difficult year even with our sales up i mean everybody's wearing a mask Everybody's social distancing. Whole Foods is a very huggy culture. Nobody's hugging. You know, we, you do elbows or you, or you kick feet with each other, and that's not quite the same, is it? And, uh, and, and people aren't socializing as much. So um, I, I, I say Whole Foods made a lot of cultural deposits for a number of years. In 2020, been making withdrawals on those deposits. So... Two more questions. One is, is in your book, you say that you like to hire with, promote from within, but you don't like to overdo that. There's, you, there's a percentage you like, or I think 80% or maybe 75% because you felt that bringing people from outside adds a bigger, uh, invigorates the culture. Right. It, tell us a little bit about your hiring and choosing of team members. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a balance really between if you only hire from within, that helps. If you only hot promote from within, then that then that really enhances the culture in the sense that people know that if they work hard, 
they can rise up and get ahead. And because Whole Foods has been growing, it's been a great place of opportunity for people for since the founding of the company. So I've watched people start out and work their way all the way up and it doesn't require a college education to, to make a lot of money at Whole Foods because uh, you can rise through the ranks, so to speak. On the other hand, if you only promote from within, then you're gonna stagnate because you're not getting enough new ideas, enough, enough innovation from outside that sort of uh, helps um, uh, uh, ferment, you might say, the innovation and creativity. On the other hand, if you promote too many people from the outside, then people begin to think, gee, you can't get ahead in this company. The way to get ahead is to go work somewhere else where you'll be greaterly, more greatly appreciated. So approximately in our, in our leadership, about 25% get promoted from outside the company and about 75% are promoted within. That's what whole, it's worked out for Whole Foods to be a pr kind of the right number, but that could vary with other companies, I think. So, okay, I, I told you before, I wanted to ask you sort of a Thanksgiving question related to the, the underlying business and your, and your passion for healthy and wholesome food. Um, you know, we've had a tough year, no doubt about it, uh, but we are gonna have Thanksgiving and we may have gatherings that are smaller than usual, but we're still gonna have gatherings with family. So what is a product that, that or a food that, that you is a, a mainstay at, the, at your table? and that you would recommend to those of us putting together our, our, our um, menus well, for Thursday? I mean, I may be the, a bad person to ask. Simply, I'm, I'm plant-based, right? I'm vegan. So. Oh, I know, but I knew that. I wasn't thinking you were gonna say turkey, but I, <laughs> but I would like, but that doesn't, we all, we all eat vegetables. So, or, or what, what, what is, what's your go-to um, uh, dish? What's my go-to dish? My go-to dish generally is a a bean stew with a ton of vegetables in it. That's my that's my favorite. That'll dish. be on that'll be on the table at Thanksgiving in your family. Absolutely, with with oh. he is you know a lot of beans, but then a ton of vegetables from sweet potatoes to broccoli to cauliflower to okra, whatever whatever veggies are in season. Okay. All right. Well. Uh, I hope you have a great Thanksgiving and thank you for all that you've done and thank you for your book and your guidance and your leadership and for participating in this uh, conversation this afternoon. Thank um, you. I think, do you have any final words or anything else, anything we missed that you would want to say? I always like to give people that chance if they, if they feel that there's a message they want to convey. I guess I'll convey a message of, um, of hope that we are, um, America's going through a difficult time and we're not, we're not nearly through it. We're not going to be through it anytime soon. So I can't give you a short-term hope, but uh, if, you know, I'm a student of American history and we have faced bigger challenges than this one. And uh, we've stumbled our way through it, but we have gotten through it. And I think we will get through this one too. Maybe it's going to take a few years, uh, maybe longer, but I do think, America has a great capacity to renew itself. And sometimes we're best when our backs are against the wall and we're forced to make changes. We're forced to make reformations. Uh, and uh, I, there's a great underlying love of the country by Americans. I think we've seen it in this election cycle. And uh, yeah, I'm very hopeful about the future, even if I'm not particularly hopeful about the short-term future. Other than I think we're gonna get past COVID I think a year from now we will be past it and we will be a lot of our normal behaviors will be returning, which is, which is going to be a good thing. Well, stop being so scared. That's going to be a good thing. Yes. I think that's important. You got to live, got to go forward and we are going to get through COVID and thanks very much for doing this. We really appreciate it. You bet. Robert, thanks for all AEI does. You guys are a great institution and I'm proud to support you. Thank you very much.